Good Wednesday morning. The theme continues. Uh, the Acts of the Apostles, they're the really being persecuted, okay? Stephen um, was martyred, etc. But what is so interesting <clears throat> is the movement here. Saul, meanwhile, was trying to destroy the church. He'll be great architect of the church, but he's trying to destroy the church, entering house after house and dragging out men and women. He handed them over for imprisonment. Boy, guy was a fanatic. Well, he's a passionate man. He took it seriously. Now, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Thus, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the, uh, the Christ to them. With one accord, the crowds paid attention to what was said by Philip. When they saw, when they heard it, they saw the signs he was doing. Oh, see that? Unclean spirits crying out in a loud voice came out of the possessed people. And many paralyzed and crippled people were cured. See, they're living the Christ life. See? But then, see? So you got martyrdom, but effective preaching as well. It's both. See, it's the early life of the church. It goes on forever. See? But the, John's gospel, this is the sixth chapter, which is absolutely eloquent. I'll read it to you, okay? Jesus said to the crowds, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. And whoever believes in me will never thirst. But I told you that, although you have seen me, you do not believe. That's the crowds. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me, because I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me, famous lines. And this is the will of the one who sent me, that I should not lose anything of what he gave me, but I should raise it up on the last day. But this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I shall raise him up on the last day. See, that's it. That's John. That's how Paul, John, I'll raise him up on the last day, the resurrection of the dead. He's not promising you earthly paradise. He's promising you a, an eternal paradise, the same. I am the bread of life. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood. Do you see? Yeah. That's the life of the faith. You see the life of the Eucharist. But also, as you see in the Acts of the Apostles, the life of the faith in a given world that you're living in. For, for the, in the Acts of the Apostles, to be a Christian was very, very dangerous. And you have a guy like Saul who becomes the 13th apostle, you know, he, uh, he's a passionate man. He's a, he's a man deeply committed. He's a Pharisee, deeply committed to the Jewish law. You see? And he is the one who is leading the persecution of the Jews, of the, of the Christians. And then after his conversion, they didn't trust him right away. They said, wait a minute, this is, this is the guy that had been roughing us up. See? But it's on the road to Damascus. It's like God calls him, Christ calls him to himself. Come on, I need you, Paul. You know, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting? What's the matter with you? That singular insight, is, you can almost argue, is the creation of the church. Saul realizes that Christian community is the risen body of Christ. That is genius. It's called religious genius, is to see it and to recognize in the flesh of the church the risen Christ. See, and especially in the life of the martyrs, but also the very life of the faith itself. See, it's not pious. It's there's a profound insight in the unity of Christ, the unity of the church. See, that's Paul. Why are you persecuting Saul? Saul, why are you persecuting me? What's the matter with you? You see, <laughs> who who are you? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Wow. You get it? That's a wow moment. The great line in one of the songs, he touched me, Barbara Streisand, he touched me, and nothing is the same. That insight, there is nothing is the same after that. And out of that singular insight, Paul's insight into what is the church. That's why there are secular writers who see Paul, not in religious terms, but in historical terms, as the architect of Christianity because he's the one with the insight. Who and what is the church? 
and at a very radical level, a deep level, at the very root of what, that's what radice means, root. The very root of what is the faith is the church as the body of Christ in the world. And this is the truth. If you look at your own faith experience, how do you come to the faith? You come to the faith through other believers, and especially heroic believers, great believers. You know, I, that was so influential to me, not only in the parish when I grew up as a boy, okay, for sure, but the faith that people brought and the confidence they brought, especially to dying, that, to me, may be the, the singular and most powerful witnessing how people came to grips with their own life and accepted their deaths with a profound deepness and profound uh, uh, peacefulness and the hope, and hope, the hope, that with Christ we will rise again and be together again in paradise. I told you what my aunt Arjen had said to me as, she, as I was parting from the village in Italy. 50 years ago, si vediamo in paradiso. We will see each other again in paradise. Because she knew she's not going to see me again in this life. Si vediamo in paradiso. We will see each other again in paradise. I think of that. I think of the lives of the saints, but I don't think of the saints. Saints, I think of my mother and father and my friend, Junie. <laughs> oh, I, I talk to them all the time. Pop, don't let me screw this thing up. Ma, keep your eye on me, all right? Junie all the time. Junie, don't let me F this thing up, okay? Come on, give me a break. Help me. <laughs> They're my saints. My saints are the people I have loved and been loved by. I don't know any about St. Anthony or St. This, St. That. I just know the people who have been the center of Christian life for me because they loved me, not because they preached to me. They didn't preach anything to me. But they loved me and they loved each other faithfully. When I think of fidelity, I think of my father taking off his life, you know, taking his life preserve and tying it to me while we were in trouble. At that moment, my father was giving me his life. I was just a boy. He gave me sure I lived, even though he would drown. Remember, I told that story hundreds of times. Do you want to understand love? Take your life. Do you want to understand love? That you're willing to die for somebody else. I saw that. It's not a theory to me. It's not just Christianity. I lived it. When my father took off, our life preservers, we had two in the boat, one for him, one for me, and he tied them both to me, tied them. So I had one in front, one in the back. We kept sized. And it was a chance for that. It was bad out there. I was only nine years old at the time, I think. I would have survived. He would have drowned. My father couldn't swim. He was a very poor swimmer. And he had all the wrong advice. He wanted me to swim to Scotch Cap, which was a, an island. No, you stay with the boat. My dad gave me all bad advice, verbally, existentially. He tied his, he gave me his life. He tied his life preserver to me. That's fidelity. When I think of the church, when I think of what it is to love somebody, when I think of Christ's love dying on the cross, I see my father also taking off his, uh, giving me his life jacket. Well, now, we learn the faith through the, exi through the existence we live and through our own existential experiences. Fidelity, give you a life jacket. If, you're not, if you say you love me and you're not willing to give me your life jacket, forget it. I don't know. And I know this much. If I tell you I love you, there's no holes barred. I am going to take off my life jacket for you. That's the truth. Not because I am such a great person. It's because that's the model of love I have. It's my father in a boat in Mamaguen 70 years ago see, who gave me his life preserver. That's how it is. We lived a life we learn through the love, we learn love and the love of Christ and the love we have for each other. That's the truth. I hope some of this makes sense to you. In the gospel, we have the bread of life, the Eucharist, that nurtures us in our heroic living out, day by day, our own version of the Acts of the Apostles, our fidelity to our callings, whatever that calling may be, whatever. Whatever.